everybody. So, today I wanted to look at a classic, classic physics problem, the frictionless cart with a hanging mass. So we are very fortunate here at Winnicott to have some really nice physics equipment. Some of our nicest is this PASCO cart system that we have. Um, here I have a metal track and a cart that has extremely good ball bearings. Now the wheels here spin with very little friction, which allow us to, for the most part, ignore friction when we're dealing with problems here. It's nice because it allows us to solve for an acceleration without having to take that into, into account. So here we have a cart with two black masses in it, which are going to give us a mass of 1.5 kilograms. And over on the other side, I'm going to have a hanging mass of 150 grams. So my question is, what would the acceleration of the system be using Newton's second law? Well, I'd like to go through the process of how to solve it using variables, and then we'll try it with those numbers and see what we get. Sound good? Good. So. When we are solving any of these systems problems where we are trying to find the acceleration of the system, the first step is always to draw in all of the forces that are acting on each mass. So what I would like to do is to take a moment and do that. So if you could please, go ahead and draw in our cart system where we have a cart with nice frictionless wheels attached to a string that goes over a frictionless pulley and is attached to mass two. Good, let's draw in all the vectors. Now I usually go left to right, and what I'm gonna say is M1, let's look at the forces involved. Well, obviously, there's going to be the force of gravity down on it, and I'm gonna label that M1G. Now the thing is, the cart doesn't accelerate up or down. That's because there's another force acting on it opposite that, and that force, we talked about it in the previous class, is known as, yeah, that's right, the normal force. Good. So I'm going to draw in a vector that is equal and opposite in length. All right. What other force is acting on that mass? No, no, we're ignoring friction. Maybe I'll make a note of that. Yeah, that's right. The other force that we can take a look at is the tension in the string. Now I'm going to go ahead and draw that as an arrow, and I use a capital T to represent tension. Some teachers might use capital F with a subscript T, tomato, tomato, right? So tension. Are there any other forces acting on that? Nope. I don't think so either. Let's look at the other mass. M2, what's holding it back? Yeah, that's right, the tension in the string. And that tension is actually the same throughout that string. Picture a guitar string. If you pluck a guitar string, if you pluck it at one end or the other, the tension in the string is still the same throughout. These tensions should be drawn equal and in opposite directions. What's the only other force acting on it? That's right, M2G. And M2G should be greater than the tension. M2G is greater than the tension, so I should draw it longer. Now, before I can sum up my forces, I gotta figure out which direction is positive. Yeah, I can do the same thing I do on the Atwood machine. I can actually take our system and make this the positive direction. Because really what we're looking at here, if I just pick this mass up and the system moves back and forth, can you see that it's really just in the x direction? Yeah, yeah, I think you can. Good. So my next step it's going to be to find the sum of the forces that causes the mass to accelerate. To find the theoretical acceleration.
Oh, uh, yeah. Using theory to predict what the acceleration of the system would be. That theory is Newton's second law. The sum of the forces causes the mass to accelerate. And I'm going to look at it in just the direction of motion. And when I do, I go back to my diagram and I figure out what are the direction of the forces, positive or negative. And are they in the direction of motion or not? Here's the kicker. Ready? M1G. I would call that in the Y direction. Normal force in the Y direction. Thing is, my system is accelerating in the X. So when I do the sum of the forces in this particular problem, I am not going to include those. I'm only going to include the forces in the direction of motion. So I'm going to end up with plus tension right here. I look at my other mass, and this tension is pointing this way in the negative direction. And then I'm going to have M2G pointing in the positive direction. And now, how do I account for the mass of the system? Well, these are my forces, and my system is going to be M1 plus M2. Got it? Now, what's going to happen to those tensions? Yeah, you see it. Those tensions are going to cancel out. And what I'm left with is a simple M2G causes the masses to accelerate. Now we're talking in letters, but what you should really realize, it's the weight of this hanger is applying a force to the system that causes the masses to accelerate. And of course, this is a straightforward one. It'll get more complicated as we, as we learn more. So to find the acceleration in this case, it's going to be M2G over M1 plus M2. I never just memorize this formula because, of course, they don't stay this easy this long or that long. Let's try it with the values that we have. We said that M1 was equal to 1.50 kilograms and M2 is equal to 150 grams. I'm going to write the word grams out just to make sure we're clear. All right, so let's substitute those in. For M2, oh, 150 grams. How many kilograms is that? Don't yell out the wrong answer. I already think very highly of you. I don't want to mess that up. I know that you know that there are 1,000 grams is equal to one kilogram. So 150 grams would be 150 divided by 1,000, or 0 0.150 kilograms. Multiplied by 9.8, divided by 1.5 plus 0.15. All right, get your calculators out. If I'm good enough, I'm going to edit this in Edpuzzle and make you get that right before you can get on. So get your calculators out. Stop slacking. Yeah. Anybody else get an acceleration of 0.891 meters per second squared? Based on the precision of my masses here, I might just go 0.89 meters per second squared. Check. So if 0.89 is my theoretical acceleration, how do I test to see whether or not that is accurate? Well, at Winnicott, kind of, we're pretty lucky. We have some nice equipment, and along with our Pasco track and cart, which is nearly frictionless, we have some vernier software and hardware that allows us to measure the acceleration of this cart. We're going to do that by utilizing this pulley down here. Now, the pulley is actually attached to a photo gate, 
that sends a beam of light across. Now the wheel, or the pulley, when it turns, it's going to complete one revolution. It's going to block the photo gate ten times. What the computer knows is that in the software it's written that when it's blocked ten times, it's traveled the circumference of the wheel. And since the string is actually set over that wheel, we can measure the distance the card is traveling. Now that's hooked up to my LabQuest Mini, oops, which is then hooked up to my computer. And we can even see the graphs that are obtained by doing that. So conceptually, here's what we're looking at. We should, if the object is accelerating, obtain a displacement versus time graph that is going to be parabolic. The velocity versus time graph, because it's accelerating, should be linear. And our acceleration graph should be horizontal. Now the slope of that velocity versus time graph should be equal to the acceleration of the system. So that's what we're going to do. And let's see if we can find that. So I'm going to go ahead. I've got my Vernier probe all set, ready to go. I'm going to take my hanging mass, set it over the beautiful frictionless pulley, and keep that string tight. And I'm going to go ahead and hit Collect. Ready? And here we go. One, two, three. Nice. Let's take a look at the computer. I go ahead and look at this graph. I'm going to highlight a certain region right there where it's nice and linear for velocity. Do my regression statistic, and what do I get? We got 0.8586 meters per second squared. Now, I know you don't believe me, so I'm going to cut to this video and edit it together. But I have an acceleration, experimental, of 0.857 meters per second squared. Now, if I want to find the percent error, I would do my theoretical value, 0.89, minus my experimental, divided by the theoretical, Absolute value times 100. Let's do that. Woo! Did you guys get 3.7%? And that's while I'm... I'm running my own cameras, my own mics, two different cameras at the same time, and I'm collecting data. Damn, that's good. Nah, you know what's really good? Newton's second law. Because it really works. It really works. You just saw it work right there. Thanks.